Welcome to Monticello Podcasts, where we look at various aspects of Monticello, Thomas Jefferson, and the work of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which has owned and operated in Monticello since 1923. I'm Chad Woolerton, Monticello's webmaster. Jefferson once wrote, A little rebellion now and then is a good thing. In that spirit, Larry J. Sabato, founder of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia, has proposed 23 changes to the United States Constitution in a new book dedicated to the memory of Thomas Jefferson. In a recent talk on Monticello's West Lawn, Professor Sabato highlighted some of his ideas and discussed how he meant to challenge people on their thinking about the sanctity of the country's framing document. And uh, let me just say what a uh, delight it is to be here in Monticello. I've been here, as many of you have, hundreds of times over the years. I was here most recently on Saturday. I had a cousin from Atlanta who, I'm sorry to say, is attending Georgia State. Uh, <laughs> but he had never seen Monticello. He was coming through town, going up to Winchester to see his, his folks. And I said, you've got to stop. And he said, well, I've only got a few hours. And I said, well, I know what to do. There's only one thing to do, and that's uh, to see the university. And then... Uh, come up and see Monticello, and I've heard from him three times since, and all he can do is talk about Monticello and, and how much he learned. Uh, by the way, I've, uh, I've literally had, gosh, dozens, uh, maybe hundreds of tours, and as much as I've read about Jefferson, as much as I've read about Monticello, I have never had a tour when I didn't learn something. I think the, the guides do a wonderful job, and they do a lot of individual research, and it really comes across. Uh, so if any of you are guys, let me salute you. Uh, you do a terrific job, and, and I know just from listening to people leaving uh, the house uh, how much they enjoy the time with you. I also want to say a word, uh, if I can. I'm trying to run out the clock, so I don't have to get into this controversial stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, I've got to, to, to um, first acknowledge my dear friends, uh, Rui and Nestor Ramzani. I know many of you. Uh, off and on through the years, but Rui and Nestor have been dear friends. Uh, Rui actually uh, sent me the telegram when I was uh, living in Britain, studying in Britain, offering me the faculty position. And when I get complaints uh, on a daily basis, uh, I often say, I agree with you, you're absolutely right, and here is Rui Ramazani's address. He hired me, he needs to hear this. He's received thousands of such missives over the years. Uh, but, um, you know, coming up and seeing uh, Dan and, and Lou, uh, where is Lou? I've, mis I've misplaced There's Lou. Dan and Lou Jordan. They have just been such the perfect Monticello couple. They have done everything right. They've never put a foot wrong. They've had so many difficult jobs to do, and they've made it look easy over the years. Now, I'm sure that the successor is acceptable. I don't know who this person is. But I, I can tell you, I'm sorry, Alice Andy, I know, I know you've got a little bigger, but no one can replace Dan and Lou Jordan. It is not possible. I just told them that my choice for a successor would have been a hologram of the Germans. <laughs> Just saying whatever they wanted to say, and you know, we could do something. <laughs> they, uh, and I'm just so pleased to hear they're, they're going to be in Ivy, and they're going to be looking out on the Shenandoah, and it's, it's just wonderful to have them uh, remaining in the community and, and taking a major role, I know, in other ways. So uh, having said all that, let me, let me tell you a little about this book, and I've, I've been very, very pleased with the response to it. I've been pleased that, that it's actually <laughs> many authors pleased when a book does well, and it's done very well since it came out in October, so much so that we've got a uh, revised paperback coming out in June. It's a, a little different version of it, so those of you who bought the paperback will have to buy the, 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 the other one, so you need to get both copies. Uh, now I'm not claiming that, that uh, it's gone to number one in Amazon because I'm not a presidential press secretary who rats on his boss. <laughs> I, can't, I can't guarantee that a book will go to number one. You, you have to be a rat leaving a sinking ship for that to happen. Uh, I do think it's amazing that people get away with that. I, I knew Scott McClellan, and I'm going to be, you know I'm blunt, Dan. He is absolutely the worst presidential press secretary in my long association with presidential press secretary. The worst. He was so inarticulate, I was embarrassed about him representing a White House or the country. And then, to, how did he get the position? I, I asked many people, and they said, 
he's just so loyal to the Bushes. Well, so much for loyalty. When, when you see the opportunity to make a buck, some people will, will go for it. Now he sees, he sees all the terrible things they were doing. He was blind to it, and the White House had no clue that, that what that piano player was doing. In the, in the period there. Really, really quite amazing. But that's America, and you're entitled to make a buck any way that you can, and he's a classic example of somebody who has made it any way he could. Uh, so anyway, it's not that kind of book, thank goodness. It's, I hope, a more serious book. It's less about current politics. During the Q&A session, if you want to ask questions about current politics, I'm happy to do it. I understand there's a campaign going on. Uh, some people, oh, here are the McCluskeys, how are you? Here are Joe and Clifton. I've got to stop this. The whole time will be taken up saying hello to old friends in here. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry Clifton's here because he disagrees with half the things in his book. I'm not calling him Clifton. Now, we got another session, and I made a mistake, and I'm just, you go, just put, keep your hand down. Uh, but Clip, what Clifton doesn't know is that, that this book, which proposes 23 ways to change the Constitution, and to correct what I believe are some inherent flaws in the Constitution, which were not obvious in the beginning, uh, when the Constitution was written, much of this made sense because we didn't have mass democracy, we didn't have political parties, we didn't have many of the, uh, the governing principles that uh, that we revere today. They, they just they weren't accepted at the time. They weren't even thought of at the time. So of course it was a constitution written in that context by a group of men trying to keep a country together, a small country, 13 states, 2 million population just gathered on the on the East Coast, and now we're a continental country with worldwide responsibilities. Uh, we have a very different system. Uh, we expect everybody to be involved. We want everybody to be involved. Mass democracy is a fundamental. And so it's no surprise that some pieces of the Constitution no longer work very well. Our system doesn't work terribly well. That's, that's my view, having watched it uh, and worked in it and tried to work with it for all these decades. And so I've suggested things, and people always say, my God, that is outrageous, that is radical. Let me stress to you, the, the vast majority of the Constitution, including the basic structure and the separation of powers and, and the branches as they're designed more or less, and the entire Bill of Rights, remain untouched. You know, were there pieces of the Bill of Rights I would have enjoyed toying with? Yes, but I don't want to be shot. Um, <laughs> I, I tell this story for you, it's absolutely true. Shortly after the book was published, I did uh, Dying Dream Show, which was one of my favorite NPR shows. And during the, the broadcast, a fellow named George from Southwest Virginia called up, and he claimed to be the closest living relative to James Madison. Uh, and he was furious about this book. And he made it clear that he had a large gun collection, and if necessary, he was going to use it against me, because he wanted that Constitution kept precisely the way James Madison had designed it, written it. Well, just a couple of days prior to that, I received a letter from the president of the James Madison Society of Descendants. And he praised the book and said he was absolutely, he claimed to be the closest living to James Madison. I don't know how you determine these things. You need to get another commission to you know, figure out who's the closest. But, and get some DNA analysis. We'll figure out who's who's closest. But in any event, uh, he said this is exactly what Mr. Madison would have wanted. And I'm convinced that he would have wanted us to make sure the Constitution kept up with the times. So I read this letter to George, and George hung up. <laughs> That's the last I heard of George, and I'm still living. He hasn't, he hasn't shot me yet. Um, and and really, fundamentally, that was my motivation. My my motivation was to make some of these changes, though. This, this is a book, I hope, for good citizens, but it's also a teaching book, and it really was designed in the classroom. I teach a large class, a 101 class, every spring that Clifton first assigned to me many years ago. Uh, got about 500 students in it, and it, it's tough to get them involved and active and interested, particularly in a large class. You've really got to reach them somehow or another, and I've learned that controversy helps. So I wanted this book to stir the pot and make people think. And sometimes people would embrace the changes and get very excited about them. And even this morning I got emails. I mean, the thing came out in October, I'm getting emails 
in May from people saying, oh, I loved this, oh, I hated this, you know, and, and on and on. But I wanted people to think. And, and sometimes, as I say, you get excited and happy about a change, and other times you get very angry and unhappy. But you think, as a consequence, you think about the Constitution. And maybe you read it for the first time in a long time, because most people haven't read the Constitution. They claim to be representing the Constitution. They claim to care about the Constitution. But they haven't even read the Constitution. They don't know what's in there. More Americans can name the three members of the three stooges than can name the three branches. <laughs> this is true. There was a survey done on what people know about the Constitution. They know almost nothing. So if you can create a Constitution and, and take this document and cause people to think it's not just a musty, dusty, old piece of parchment, that it's fundamental to how we live, uh, and that, indeed, there are parts that may need some adjustment and change, I was trying to get around to the point that out of the 23, there are six of them I don't support, but I don't tell you that in the book, nor will I tell you now. Uh, students try to guess which six. But I made the best possible case for these changes. Now, why did I pick them? Because we did a major uh, public opinion survey, really good firm, large sample, unlike much of what you see in public opinion polls about politics. And uh, there were quite a number of changes strongly supported by the public that I wasn't all that crazy about. Uh, nonetheless, we live in a democracy. It was worth taking uh, that point of view and trying to make the, the best of it. And I, did, I tried to do that anyway in the book. So if you read it, maybe you can try and guess which six I don't support. But I do support the other ones, and there are quite a few. And uh, as I've, I've tried to suggest, not all of them are major changes. I'll go through a few of them. But the, the first thing, if you get the book, on, on the back cover, I have, of course, uh, Jefferson, to whom I dedicated uh, the book. Could do, could not do otherwise, obviously. Um, maybe I should have also dedicated it to Mom alone, since when you spoke to him, you thought you were speaking to Jefferson. But uh, <laughs> his books are all cited in here. And uh, as Jefferson wrote uh, to James Madison, no society can make a perpetual constitution. You've already. Uh, given them the citation. Every constitution, said Jefferson, naturally expires at the end of 19 years. If it be in force longer, it is an act of force and not of right. I don't know if Jefferson meant that quite as he had written it. It was perhaps an exaggeration for his time. But I do believe that he thought it was important for Americans to regularly review the content of the constitution and see what needed to be changed and updated. Now, how did Madison respond? Well, possibly Madison was simply trying to keep Jefferson happy. I don't know. But he agreed with Jefferson when he wrote him back in February of 1790. And he said, it would give me singular pleasure uh, to see your principle first announced in the proceedings of the United States and kept always in their view as a salutary curb on the living generation from imposing unjust or unnecessary burdens on their successors. Well, that's a direct endorsement of frequent, at least, consideration of constitutional reform. Washington was, was even blunter, uh, and there were a number of citations that fit. I chose one uh, that, um, you know, from a letter uh, to uh, a uh, relative of his that he had written in November 1797, and he said, the people of the United States, for it is with them to judge, uh, can, can uh, leave the door open for change because they will have the advantage of experience on their side. They will decide with as much propriety on the alterations and amendments to the Constitution which are necessary as ourselves. I do not think we, that is the current generation, certainly the senior founders, we are more inspired, have more wisdom, or possess more virtue than those who will come after us. And uh, George Mason endorsed it, and Jeff in my uh, endorsement, in my uh, dedication to Jefferson, I of course cite his uh, 1787 letter to James Madison. I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing and is necessary in the political world as storms in the physical. And I hope that, that this book would be uh, a little bit of rebellion, and I think it is to a certain degree. But the paperback also has a wonderful citation from John Adams, who uh, late in life was written by a young man who, who had studied uh, the founders' lives and works, and he wrote to Adams, as young people often do, uh, as an idol. 
and he said, you know, I've, I've, I've uh, read everything you've written about the Constitution, and your, and your fellow founders have written about the Constitution, and we were so fortunate, and every word was divinely inspired, and the young person got very worked up. And Adams, who was, of course, extremely blunt, uh, wrote him back and said, young man, I ought to be grateful that unlike so many of your contemporaries, you're actually respectful to your elders. But I think your position is exactly wrong. You should be reading the Constitution with a critical eye and suggesting changes. That's what Adams wrote several years before he died. So I think I'm on solid ground, at least in proposing some changes and looking at uh, some possibilities. Now, I can't go through all 23. I wouldn't wouldn't uh, want to go through all 23, and we wouldn't have any time for questions. I'm just going to mention some, and then we'll uh, go in about 10 minutes to uh, your questions and, and discussion. I uh, suggest, uh, just to start out with a very radical proposal, as we look at the first uh, branch, the Congress, and we analyze the United States Senate, uh, it's important to recognize that as the United States has grown and as the population growth has been concentrated in just a handful of states, we now have a situation where just 17% of Americans, 17% of Americans elect a majority of the United States Senate. That means on the subjects on which the 17% in those states can stick together, such as transportation formulas and education formulas, usually the expenditure of money, the 17% can run the other 83%. Well, you know, the founders were concerned about the tyranny of the majority. I'm with them. I'm, I'm always concerned about minority rights. But isn't there such a thing as the tyranny uh, of the small minority? Shouldn't we be concerned also about the tyranny of the small minority? And it's actually worse than the 17%. Because under current rules, which are not constitutional, but are rules of the Senate, uh, you need 60 votes to run the United States Senate. You can't get anything major passed without 60 votes. Well, that means just 41 senators can stop anything from happening under most uh, circumstances in the Senate. Well, how many Americans can elect 41 senators? 11%. So 11% of the people can run 89% of the people. Again, it's the tyranny of the small minority. So uh, to um, Clifton's uh, disgust, I, uh, I uh, propose uh, not, not making the Senate and other House of Representatives. I want the smaller states to be better represented uh, in, the, in the United States Senate. But I simply propose granting the 10 states with the greatest population, as revised every 10 years in the census, uh, that they should receive two additional senators. They would have four senators. And the next 15 states in population, revised every 10 years according to the census, would get one additional senator. And no state would be deprived of its current two senators. So it would be a larger Senate, but much smaller than the House of Representatives. And if you crunch the numbers, you would find that about 40% of Americans could elect a majority of the Senate. So you'd still have minority rights, well represented, and yet it makes a little bit more sense to me to have 40% running the 60% rather than 11% running the 89%. So um, you can imagine how that's gone over in Wyoming. Uh, that is definitely one state I visited for the last time. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of guns there. Um, now what about the House of Representatives? There, I, I propose a regime for nonpartisan redistricting, mandatory nonpartisan redistricting, and with a wide variety of methods. It could be a judicial commission. It could be an Iowa-style system. Uh, using legislative bureaus and nonpartisan analysts, you can do a wide variety of things. But nonpartisan redistricting is an idea whose time came 30 years ago, and we still don't have it. And it's the source of so many of the problems in Congress and in the state legislatures. Because essentially, we have a system now whereby the people really don't pick the representatives. The representatives, at least via the state legislatures, get to pick they're voters, and that's exactly opposite to the intentions of the founders and exactly opposite to the proper running of any uh, of representative democracy. So nonpartisan redistricting. And then I, I'm going to let you read about the changes in terms. I had a good time um, changing the House terms to three years and having Senate terms coincide with, with uh, presidential elections and expanding the House 
to a thousand members and people say, oh my God, you're going to more than double the House of Representatives, double the trouble, uh, and yet uh, part of the provision is to keep the budget the same uh, with an inflation factor so that you would divide uh, the budget among a thousand, they would have far fewer staff aides, their, constituents would, their constituencies would be far smaller, uh, they would uh, have a chance to meet their constituents uh, personally with greater frequency, it would be easier for challengers to defeat the incumbents because you won't need nearly as much money. You can do a door-to-door -door campaign with very small constituencies. In lots of ways, it would improve the system as outrageous as it sounds. Again, thank God for tenure. Right, Louie? <laughs> thank God for tenure. The proposed Congress go to, the House of Representatives go to uh, a thousand. Uh, there are so many, so many of these ideas. I'd love to cover them all. I've got a new six-year presidential term with a fifth-year extension referendum for two additional years, which is optional. The president doesn't have to have to go for it. And it's a referendum election. It's like these judicial elections in many states where you don't have people running against one another for judge. Some states do. Texas. Uh, which, is, which is terrible, uh, it's an awful perversion of the judicial system, but it's just a yes or no, up, up or thumbs up, thumbs down referendum on the incumbent, and either the incumbent gets the additional time or not. And the whole idea of this is to reduce negative campaigning, because our presidential elections for re-election are about the incumbent anyway. If you like the incumbent, the, if the majority likes the incumbent, the incumbent's going to get another four-year term. If people don't like the incumbent, uh, then the alternative probably will be installed under most circumstances. So this would, it would reduce some of the negative campaigning, and it would make the campaigning more issue-oriented about what the president had done or not done, whether he, had, he or she had been good for the country uh, or not. War-making powers, uh, those of you who are pleased about the Iraq war won't like this one. I, I'm with the two-thirds majority who thinks it was an unnecessary war, and and uh, would like to see a way to build in more congressional power on war making, which after all was the intention of the founders. Why else would they have made the president commander in chief and given the power to declare war to Congress? They wanted divided war powers. They wanted both branches to come together on the most critical decision that can be made in any democracy, to send young people off to war, potentially to die. It shouldn't be up to just one branch. It's not completely up to the presidency, but it almost is. The powers have become so unfettered uh, in the war-making era, era that I think presidents have uh, far too much authority. So I'm proposing that while a president, under the War Powers Act, which would be incorporated into the Constitution, uh, could commit troops for up to a year, at the end of that year, Congress would have to vote on extending troop involvement, uh, and uh, if a majority of both houses, with limited debate built into the Constitution, did not agree that the involvement should continue, then all troops would have to be withdrawn within a year. That still gives a lot of flexibility to a president. A year opening up, a year in conclusion. But I think it's better than, I don't know, maybe a really unpopular, unnecessary war that's gone on for five years. What could I be referring to? Uh, we need some change. And look, don't, don't think it's partisan. What about Harry Truman in Korea? What a disaster. What about Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam? What a disaster. How many of these examples do we need before we recognize that we need a rebalancing of constitutional war powers? That's my point. And I'm, I want to get rid of the natural born citizen requirement uh, for the presidency, substituting 25, 30 years of citizenship. Come on. Uh, 14 million Americans excluded from even dreaming about running for president, and this affects senior people on both sides of the aisle, that's not America. And there really isn't any justification for it to begin with. The founders, it was just thrown into a committee report and it ended up in the Constitution. No one really understands why it's there. We can't even change something as simple as that, and it bothers me. I'll mention a couple of other <coughs> politics and then go to questions. Um, it's, it's in the political system that I think we really need uh, some change, and, and I want to see a politics article. Unlike most of the constitutions around the world, we have no politics article, because we had, as I mentioned, no mass democracy, no political parties in the beginning. Well, it's time. Even Mr. Jefferson recognized that he was wrong when he originally opposed political parties. Most of the founders were wrong in considering them factions. Eventually, they understood that 
that a society like the United States could not be run, a democracy could not be run, without political parties. Uh, I have a slogan, politics is a good, name, a good thing, which I stole from Clifton McCleskey, with his permission. And, and that comes from uh, the love of parties and the love of political activity. Politics is a good thing. I, I have this on stickers and on t-shirts. I give it to students. Um, they are just outraged. They all think politics is corrupt and nasty and violent, and there are parts of it that are. So I always remind people, politics is our substitution for coup d'etats and riots in the street. It is the rough, cutting edge of democracy. It is not supposed to be a Sunday afternoon tea party, which too many good government groups, too many goo-goos, think it should be. It, it's not supposed to be polite all the time. It doesn't have to be ugly, but it, it shouldn't be polite all the time either. Well, what should we do in the political system? We've just been through Almost this nominating process. I cannot believe how long is it. And you laugh. It's ruined my life. I thought it was going to be over in mid in mid February. I've, I've postponed everything. I, I haven't done anything for months. Don't tell anybody at the university. Uh, but uh, all I've done is this, this darn campaign. So we'll finally finish it up Tuesday. The final two primaries after Puerto Rico Sunday and then Montana and South Dakota. And one good thing about this year on the Democratic side is that you have had. Uh, a, a real choice in all 50 states. Uh, everybody's gotten to vote for once. It's not over after New Hampshire and Iowa. But let's remember that usually it is over after New Hampshire, Iowa, and a couple of other states, South Carolina, and now they've thrown Nevada in. Maybe you get to a Super Tuesday uh, of some sort. Uh, but on the whole, you have a handful of states, the same states, every four years, winnowing the field, determining the choices for everyone else, that's not a good thing. It's better to have a system where everyone does get to vote, but in a more rational way, and a way that doesn't eat up the holidays, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Can you believe this campaign where we started voting three days after January 1st? They took two hours off on Christmas. That was it. This is, this is not good for the system. It, it uh, affected the system and distorted the choices in lots of ways. So I propose a regional lottery system. You divide the United States into four, the quadrants draw themselves, it's very easy to do, and you move the campaign back to April. You don't have to start it in January. Do we really have to eat up two full years of every president's term, a year campaigning, and then a year of primaries and, and caucuses, uh, and a general election campaign? Let's shorten this thing. We, we can't do it like a parliamentary system in four or five weeks, but we can certainly shorten the, uh, the system, shorten the length of the, of the contest. So I propose starting it in April, but what would keep candidates from campaigning starting the day after the last election? Well, you can't stop them in some ways. They could be raising money and they could be giving speeches and they could be going on and talking to Wolf Blitzer endlessly. Uh, that's fine. You know, you can do that. But here's what we could do to limit the campaign. If they don't know where the campaign will start, then they will be unable to do many of the activities that cause campaigning to be so intense for so long prior to every presidential election day. So on January 1st of the actual election year, you have a lottery, you know, right in the halftime of the Rose Bowl. And the chairperson <laughs> of the Federal Election Commission comes on television and, and picks out the order of the ping pong balls, each ping pong ball having a region's name on it. And the first region goes in April, and the second region goes in May, and the third region in June, and the fourth region in July, and the two national conventions in August. And we can actually scope the whole campaign into about six and a half months. Wouldn't that be wonderful for a change? Clifton <laughs> likes that, and I appreciate that. You didn't tell me that before. Um, there, there are some people considering this plan now. We'll, we'll see. It has a good chance of getting enacted about the year I die. But uh, I'm looking forward to it, I hope. And, you know, I changed the Electoral College in various ways. There are some people here who believe that the Electoral College should be abolished. They're terribly wrong. Uh, I, I like the Electoral College because uh, of a practical reason. It undergirds federalism. But the practical reason is it isolates recounts. Think back to 2000 or any close election. How would you like to have had Florida in all 50 states. That's what you would have had in an extremely close election without an electoral college. The, the electoral college isolates 
recounts. That's why I support it, for a very practical reason. Now, uh, it's unrepresentative as currently constructed. And so, uh, naturally, I uh, add some electors to states with larger populations. Don't subtract any electors from any state, but try to make it more representative in order to reduce to the vanishing point the chances of having a president elected without the popular vote, the majority or plurality of the popular vote. I think that would be a good thing. Uh, and look, those of you, you know, for Bush in 2000 or one of the other presidents, and if you, if you weren't alive, but uh, if you liked them historically, elected with um, a minority of the popular vote, you have to admit that it undermines support for the president from day one. It, it is important to be the people's choice. And there's a way to do this and make a president be the people's choice, but also keep the electoral college. We can have our cake and eat it too with the respect to the electoral college. And I also make electors um, honorary positions. You want to you want to reward your party people, but you don't want them being live human beings casting votes so that they can be faithless electors and potentially one year switching a presidential election because a handful of them are corrupt. So the votes would be would be cast automatically. And I'm going to mention one other. Uh, there's so many here. I'm going to mention one other because this one actually has a chance. Uh, this one is is going to be introduced before the end of the year by a bipartisan group of uh, House members, I'm very pleased. They go from you know very liberal to very conservative. Our, our Congressman Virgil Goode is, is one who is organizing this, uh, helping to organize it. And it's, it's a little known provision in the Constitution which we've never really focused on because it hasn't happened since the 19th century. And that is, of course, how we resolve a deadlock in the Electoral College for president. The vice president goes to the Senate. Let's just keep it simple and focus on, on the presidency. If you have a deadlock and the Electoral College can't produce a majority uh, for a, a presidential candidate to become president, then the process moves into the House of Representatives. Sounds simple enough. Gee, they're the people's representatives. Shouldn't be a problem. Except that the founders, believing a little too strongly in federalism, not understanding that over time states would become very distorted in, the, in their differences in population, uh, and also not recognizing the importance eventually of mass democracy, established the unit rule, whereby in order to get a president, every state votes as a unit. So tiny Wyoming gets one vote, and gargantuan California gets one vote, and you need 26 votes, an absolute majority of the 50 states, to become president. Now think about what that means. Again, if the small states stuck together, you could have 17% of the people electing a president. And it's worse than that. The single member states can easily cast their ballot for president, unless the representative is schizophrenic. You know, he or she's going to be able to make up his or her mind and cast the ballot. What about the multi-member delegations? Imagine how many deadlocks there will be in the conclaves, the 50 conclaves that will have to be held with people using parliamentary procedures to foul up the works, uh, vacancies causing uh, judicial appeals, uh, absolute ties, which will result in zero vote being cast from that state. So you could have California, New York, Florida, um, uh, Illinois, the large states, not even casting a vote for president, and the decision falling to a handful uh, of the, the smaller states, getting that 26 out. It would be a disaster. There will be a revolution if it ever happens. No one knows that provision is in there. The solution's obvious. We now have one person, one vote. Unfortunately, because of redistricting, it isn't perfect, but it's one person, one vote. Every representative, more or less, represents the same number of people. There are some exceptions, but it's closer than it's ever been in American history. You have one person, one vote. That's what the Constitutional Amendment being introduced says. One person, one vote. Then you need a majority of the sitting representatives to get a new president in the case of a deadlock. And look, it's going to happen again. It's inevitable. We will have a deadlock in the Electoral College, and it will go to the House of Representatives. Well, there are other things in here. I propose um, uh, a uh, Bill of Responsibilities to match the Bill of Rights 
because there's too much emphasis, as we all know, on, on uh, one's rights and not enough on, on the uh, responsibilities of citizenship. And I lead off proposing that uh, two years of each young person's life, 18 to 26, be devoted to public service of all varieties. Is military service included? Absolutely, with additional uh, benefits coming uh, more so than for any other uh, possibility of service under the universal national service system that we're setting up here, or we're trying to set up here. Uh, and uh, look, not that many people would choose military service compared to the other alternatives, but I can guarantee you the military service will be much larger in each branch than it is right now, thereby relieving the tremendous pressure on the military and having four and five deployments for these poor families to Iraq and Afghanistan. We need a larger military, and under this system, we would have it because every young person would be serving in some capacity. But the other alternatives are obvious, whether it's Peace Corps or AmeriCorps uh, or other governmental agencies set up like a disaster strike force. Think about what having, say, 150, 200,000 young people in a disaster strike force could have done after Katrina the energy and enthusiasm of young people going into an area and rebuilding. And then there's also the alternative of nonprofit service. Qualifying nonprofit groups would be able to have a certain number of individuals serving, giving those two years through them. You know, whether it's uh, you know the boys club and the girls club or you think about anything that, that is a qualified could be a good qualifying nonprofit. So there are plenty of alternatives. The cost is, is tiny. It's amazingly small because it's, it's um, minimum wage and relatively small benefits, health benefits, definitely, but at that age, it doesn't amount to very much. Let me put it to you this way. It's a tiny fraction of the $600 billion we've already spent in Iraq heading toward a minimum of $1.5 to $2 trillion. It could go to $3 trillion by the end of the next president's term. It's hard to see how we're going to get out fully until the end of the next president's term. I'd like to see that money devoted in part to national service. Well, uh, I conclude the book by calling for not just a new constitutional convention, which you don't need to worry about anything. The first will be elected. Anything that comes out of a constitutional convention has to be submitted to the 50 states. You need 38 of them to agree to change a comma in the Constitution. The vast majority of changes will be defeated, but a few good things will pass. Don't worry about the right wing or the left wing taking over a convention, because it would kill the work of the convention. And I don't want just one convention. I want it in the first decade of every new century, so that we're forced to do what the founders wanted us to do, look at the Constitution anew at a regular interval, once a century. That's not asking too much. I don't think it's asking too much, but then I'm an academic. Um, I'm going to stop there and, and take some questions. You can ask about these uh, constitutional changes. You can ask about current politics. But don't ask me about weather or sports. I only do news. <laughs> Sir, you're going to be first. I saw your hand first. To stand up and give your name and where you're from, your rank, your serial number, <laughs> any bank accounts that may be open. Go ahead. My name is Dick Fontaine. I live here in Charleston. Sure. Uh, and uh, I was surprised you haven't talked about the coupling of money and politics. Do you have any thoughts about decoupling? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, three of the, uh, I didn't cover most of the recommendations to save you. Uh, but yes, I have three related to campaign finance. Now, why didn't I cover them? Let me tell you why. Prior to this book, I've written three books on campaign finance. They've been my worst sellers by far. Uh, <laughs> the eyes glaze over. That's, that's what I learned. I'm, it, it takes me a while to learn something. Rui and, and Clifton know this. I, I have to be hit over the head with a two-by-four repeatedly, but after the third time, I get it. And I swore never to write another book about campaign finance, and I never will. And so it's a section of the book, but I don't even mention it, fearing that it will send you in the other direction from that book table. Yeah, public financing. Public financing. Why? 
is there such apathy about what appears to me anyway to be such an obvious uh, issue? Well, the, I think all 23 are obvious, but <laughs> it's a very big, diverse country, and uh, and uh, people don't agree with us. Uh, a lot of people believe that uh, under the First Amendment, people should be allowed to spend uh, freely under every circumstance available, uh, and that somehow the system will wash out the bad effects. Well, I don't think the system does. Now, I'm not in favor of limiting... <laughs> Uh, those First Amendment rights. Unlike some, I do not call for the abolition of private money in politics because it's not possible. There's no way to do it without doing great damage to First Amendment guarantees. So I don't do that. But what I do call for is uh, instead of a ceiling amount that one can spend, which is unenforceable, you provide floors of public financing. Because the key ingredient we've learned in expenditure and campaigns is a challenger's ability to communicate a basic message to people. You can be outspent three and four to one and still win if your message is acceptable, is welcomed by the constituency, and if they're tired of what the incumbent is delivering, whether it's a presidential or gubernatorial or legislative incumbent. So that's really important to know. Uh, and contrary to what people think, money is not the alpha and the omega politics. Look at McCain. Uh, McCain uh, has raised and spent a little under, he's got 98 million total right now. It sounds like a lot of money. Um, uh, his opponents outspent him, several of them, by a mile. It didn't, it didn't affect the results. Uh, Hillary Clinton has spent 214 million. Barack Obama is now almost exactly at the 300 million dollar point. And I would simply tell you, uh, by the way, he's been outspending her dramatically, even more than he was in the beginning when she was doing more poorly. She's been doing better since he's been outspending her by more. If there was any kind of direct relationship between spending and, uh, and election results, we'd notice. And there's, there's just so much contrary information uh, to, the, to uh, suggest otherwise. All right, let me, I think, now yeah, see, see, they fell asleep. We had <laughs> see what you did? 30 bucks, Dick. Okay. You're responsible for buying 30 bucks. Okay, what do we got here? Any, any other questions? Don't tell me you're, you're ready to quit 10 minutes, 10 minutes early. Yes. I'm uh, Ron Loudenschlager. I live in Canada. Uh, sure. Ron, Canada. Oh, yeah. Canada. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts about the selection of the vice president? Oh, I, I don't change that at all. Uh, I'd love to change some vice presidents. Uh, but uh, don't change that at all. And here's why. I, I think it's, um, it's a great test for the voters of the judgment and character of the presidential nominee. It tells us enormously about that individual and whether he or she can, can make a good decision under pressure, make a tough decision. It's always tough. There's never a perfect candidate. Um, it also tells us how, um, how good their, their personal judgment is in uh, surveying another individual and making a personnel choice, a key personnel choice. I don't want to change it. You know, there have been a lot, loads of proposals about how uh, we shouldn't even have vice presidents until after the election, that the winning presidential candidate should nominate a uh, vice president at that point when politics wouldn't come into it, which is a joke. It would always come into it. And then the Senate would confirm uh, the vice president. I think it's a terrible idea for loads of reasons. Uh, then others have suggested that the convention is, is too pressured a time to make that choice. At one time, that was probably true that the National Committee should come into session a month after the convention and ratify the choice of a presidential nominee. Well, that isn't necessary anymore. Even when you have a situation like the Obama-Clinton battle, it's essentially over sometime in June, and this will be. It's been over. It's been over since February. And, and the media, and certain analysts, have been suggesting to you that it's more competitive than it is. It ended in February, I mean, practically speaking. But we've extended it because it's more exciting and it's more interesting. Uh, and believe me, the, the winning candidate, Obama, has already been thinking a great deal about this. And we'll have from mid-June, when this will be absolutely resolved, uh, to the convention to pick a vice presidential choice. And McCain has had even longer and has been working on it, despite the show you see in Arizona doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean a thing who they invite. It's all for public consumption. Okay, let's see, what else do we have? You got in the back? Yes. Yes, sir. I'm John Maddox from Charlottesville. Yes, John. One of the talking heads on the Bill O'Reilly show last night suggested that Hillary Clinton run as an independent. 
as a Republican, no doubt. That would make a lot of sense. If you were a Republican, you'd want to encourage that. You'd want to put her on the ballot. What do you think about that? Zero chance. Absolute zero chance. There's a greater chance that she'll continue the campaign till the convention, as hopeless as it is. But I don't think she'll do that because she has further ambitions. Obviously, she hoped to be the nominee. She was the heavy front runner at one point. Uh, but she's young. Uh, she's 60 years old. She'll, uh, she will be. Uh, no, that's young. <laughs> there was a laugh over there. What the hell's going on? There you go. <laughs> I'm from the don't trust anybody over 30 generation. I've raised that to eight. I'm at 80 right now and, and climbing. I'll you know, be 90 next week. Don't trust anybody over 90. Uh, but look, she's uh, she wants to run. If Obama loses in 2012, if he wins after eight years, even if he hasn't been successful. She can run and say much as McCain is saying, well, I ran against him. I told you he wasn't going to be very good. I predicted this. You're going to hear that from McCain once you get past the convention and once it's impossible for uh, a conservative third-party candidate to qualify who could eliminate his chances of winning. You're going to hear McCain say, I ran against this guy. I told you he'd be terrible. You know, and that's going to, he's got to separate himself from Bush. He'll keep the Bush's 27% because they have nowhere to go. A few of them will go off and fish on election day, the vast majority will end up voting because they'll fear Obama. They won't vote for Obama. So, uh, look, it's not going to happen. Uh, believe She won't run as an independent. She'll hope to run again in the future. Probably won't work out that way, but uh, she has to have the hope. She will keep hope alive. As another presidential candidate said many years ago. Um, do we have anything else? We, we have to have more questions. Yes, uh, in the back. One, one Elliot Leffler here from Charlottesville. Um, back to your talk. I'm, I'm wondering, with your um, young person's national service, if you see a plan to tie that into an educational incentive at all? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I've outlined that in the, in the book and costed it out. I think it's a very reasonable cost. Obviously, much greater educational and other benefits for those serving in the military. They're risking life and limb. Uh, but there is some benefit some direct benefit for a couple of years of college for, for all young people. And I, you know, I think that that is, is essential. It would be justified given the work produced for the greater good of society. Um, so yes, that, that is a piece of the proposal. I'm, I'm very proud of this proposal. There have been plenty of universal national service proposals, but none like this. Uh, no one's ever expanded it to nonprofits. Uh, no one's proposed some of the other governmental opportunities and uh, costed it out the way that I have. So uh, I feel quite good about it, uh, and I hope that people will take a look at it. Uh, you know, I found, I, I wondered how young people would respond to this, uh, because in an earlier time, certainly uh, my generation, the Vietnam generation, we would have opposed it because we would have thought it was a backdoor draft. I've been delighted in the classroom and all over the country. This has been mainly adopted by by uh, professors for classroom use. I've just been so pleased that young people have been not only open to the idea, but enthusiastic about the idea. You know, that's a very idealistic moment in life. You want to do something. You want to see the country. You want to see the world. You want to do some good. That's the moment to strike. And, and we, could, we could do this. We could do this for relative pennies. And, and the greater good for society, the cost-benefit ratio, believe me, is, is a very positive one for our country. Tom? Tom Daniel, Charlottesville. Related to that comment, to what do you describe the enthusiasm that our children have exhibited in this campaign? Is this just a fad, uh, or do you think there really are some basic things going, seismologic things going on in society where the younger generation is truly going to be committed to a role in the political process for the first time in generations? Well, everything's cyclical. I compare, the, I'm delighted that so many young people are very active and interested in politics this year. A, a record number did participate in the Democratic uh, process, or the Democratic uh, primary and caucus process, less so on the Republican side, but then more young people are identified disproportionately so uh, with the Democratic Party. That's why they showed up there. And they did. Uh, produce a larger percentage, proportionally, of the 18 to 29 year olds in the primary process than we saw four years ago or eight years ago. This is this is all to the good. 
Yeah, but of course, you know, that happened in 68 and 72, remember? That was, that was the peak of the cycle. Young people got very interested and active in politics. Things change, times change. I hope that the new president will be able to keep that kind of energy and enthusiasm. And one way to do it is what John Kennedy did with the Peace Corps. Universal National Service. I think that could really light a fire under many young people and keep them interested and active. So it all connects. It all connects. Uh, let me ask Larry to look in his crystal ball and give us some names of likely vice presidential uh, Dan, I charge a lot of money for that. <laughs> I just can't do that. I've been studying it. I got, I've got 44 candidates uh, on my website. There, there are all kinds of possibilities. And truthfully, I can tell you, I've always guessed wrong. Uh, everybody in the business guesses wrong. And the reason we guess wrong is because once we start chattering about a name, most candidates say, strike that one off the list. We're going to surprise them. That's how we got Dan Quayle. <laughs> and I like her, but she was a disaster. The vice presidential candidate, Geraldine Ferrara, to be bipartisan about it. But they wanted to surprise us, and they ended up surprising themselves. <laughs> the candidates were disasters on the campaign trail. So they may do it again. What, what shocks me is they have months, they have hundreds of staff aides and researchers, and they have gotten it wrong one out of three times in modern American history, really picked a stinker. And, and that takes some doing, given the time they have to study it and think about it. To screw it up that often, oh, I liked Alvin Barkley. I didn't see him around. He died down there in Washington and Lee giving a speech. It was true. He just, just talked about how, how he, would, uh, he, would, uh, he was looking forward to heaven one day once he finished his time on earth, and he dropped dead. I mean, wow, what a way to go out. That was at the mock convention at Washington Lee. I think at 56. He, he died at the mock convention. So, oh, he wasn't that bad. He was a nice fellow. I'm talking about real disasters. You know, we've, had, we've had a lot of them in and out of office. I can think of one who's in right now, uh, frankly. But, uh, yeah. Lindsay? Yeah, Lindsay Doring. I want to find out from you, uh, I happen to think for uh, in the state highway system from the last way things the federal government did. Yeah. And uh, the Constitution doesn't spend much time talking about the interaction between national government, state government, and local government. Don't you think there should be some provisions in there that deal with these interactions and the sharing of responsibilities between those governments? Because uh, the interstate highway system is, is as good as we think it is. Uh, they can do that on a national scale. The states could do it on the state scale. The local, yet the localities ask to pay for it all. Why, why can't we do better than that in the Constitution? Lindsay, it's a great question. I can tell you, um, as far as the interstate highway system goes, I am an ocean of ignorance. Um, I know, I know Ike, uh, that was, Ike did it. Uh, but, you know, what I know about interstate highways other than driving them, uh, you could put in a thimble in a room left of your thumb. So I really can't comment on that part of it. Uh, and all I can tell you is, I have, for this book, a website. It's called amoreperfectconstitution.com. And the biggest piece of it is, a, is for citizens to propose a 24th amendment. I've got 23 I've come up with, and by no means have exhausted the legitimate possibilities. And you may just have come up with a good 24th, and I want you to go to that website. I expect to see it by the end of the week. <laughs> You know, you once took my campaigns and elections class, and I'm going to go back and change your grade. It's not good. <laughs> all right? And that's, that's what I'd suggest to you. And that's true for all of you. I hope you go to the website, amoreperfectconstitution.com, and suggest your 24th Amendment, or suggest some of the other 23 are terrible ideas. Do whatever you want. Express yourself. Be happy. <laughs> Thank you so much.